I want to just begin by going back a little bit because you know we all know we're in an economic crisis, right? Everybody knows this now that massive unemployment, collapse in most industries, all the major sectors are down, uh, yet some essential prices are going up, and etc., etc., etc. You know, sales of everything is down from motorcycles to male underwear, which is the biggest indicator globally of recession. Uh, actually, <laughs> two biscuits, two, you know, you name it, okay? So there's a huge demand collapse, there's a major economic crisis, and this has been going on now for two years. So it's really quite a serious thing. How did we get into this mess? So I just want to step back a little bit and talk about how we got into this mess and then lead up to where we are today. So, you know, the period of boom that was being celebrated, the, the mid-2000s that uh, we see as the time when India was emerging on the global stage, this massive dynamic economy that is up there with China and we're vying for who is the fastest growing economy and all that. Do you remember those days? So, that's the period when actually a lot of these problems started, okay? Because that was a growth that was both based on inequality and delivered even more inequality. It was based on which kinds of inequality? It was based, first of all, on very what we call segmented labor markets, on the ability of employers to rely on existing social discrimination by gender. So we, we have one of the highest gender wage gaps in the world. Women are occupationally segmented into the least paying kinds of activities. And everything women do is generally undervalued, even by the state, okay, which pays Asha as an undervalued helpers and so on, nothing. Uh, then it's, by, it's segmented by caste. So, in fact, our labor markets are still hugely casteist. I don't have to tell you, you probably all know, but you go into any organization and actually try and find out who is doing which kind of job, and you'll be shocked to realize even both public and private employment in India, our NSS data tell us, hugely casteist in terms of occupational and wage discrimination. It's segmented by ethnic category, it's segmented by location, it's segmented by you know, where you are, what you are, etc. What does that do? It allows employers to exploit all these social differences to really extract labor at the cheapest possible rate. And that's been a feature of the growth process. That was a critical feature of that growth. So all the shiny infosys and other things that we were so proud of as the sign of our growth relied hugely on those segmented labor markets, relied on the informal workers who contributed to security, to uh, catering, to uh, all the other activities that enabled those big shiny offices to sell cheaply the software abroad, for example. Okay, the formal sector has always relied hugely on this, but across the board, the Indian growth story relied on this inequality, and of course then added to it. The other thing that it relied on hugely was the fact that there are huge swathes of the country which are rich in minerals, which are rich in forests, which are rich in, which typically are still populated by Adivasis who have no political voice. And so you could declare entire areas overnight as municipalities and enable a company to go in there and start extracting the mineral resources because suddenly the people who had lived there forever have no rights. You could extract every kind of natural resource at the cheapest possible rates and in fact a large part of that growth was hugely extracted. So it relied on the fact that you have Adivasi communities in different localities who do not really have the same political rights, similar in fact as we heard to Kashmiris just now, to enable a particular pattern of growth. Obviously when you do all this you then further add to the inequality, so it's no surprise that this is the period where you get the emergence of the really graphic kinds of you know, pictures of inequality that are now sort of famous globally, you know, Antila versus the slums, or, you know, the richest eight people owning 52% of India's assets, that kind of thing, okay? That, in fact, was the pattern of growth. Now, one outcome of that means that a large part of your population really doesn't get much pur purchasing power. Wages grow, but not as much as the income grows. So when GDP was growing at 7 to 10%, Wages were growing at maybe 3 to 4 percent, but they were still growing, okay? <laughs> we're getting to the, I mean, this was the good part, okay? I'm telling you about the good days. We'll get to the bad days. So that was an outcome which eventually means that you're going to end up 
not getting enough demand for your goods. That had already started happening from around 2010, 2012 onwards. Already the economy was slowing down. From 2012, investment rates have been falling in India. And from 2015, they have been absolutely falling. That is, ab absolute investment is coming down every year, okay? So then, Mr. Modi comes to power on the basis of this announcement that he's going to make everything better. Remember Achit and all that. So, suddenly we are told that this is aspirational India, you know, it's going to he's going to deliver jobs, this government is going to clean up the system which is terribly corrupt and thereby give you all the things which you were supposed to get in that period of boom. And of course we know that we didn't get that. What we got was an even more extreme form of crony capitalism. We, got, we had crony capitalism earlier, but this is now a, sh a smaller number of cronies who are getting a larger share of the pie. And accordingly, therefore, it actually causes the rest of the economy to shrink because you're really further concentrating both ownership and the ability to actually make these critical economic decisions. Again, it's a more or less still a continuation of what was happening, but in more extreme form. But then, of course, we have Note Bandi, the famous demonetization of 16th November 2016, which dramatically impacted the informal sector. It destroyed agriculture, it destroyed most informal activities in the rural areas, it destroyed many, many economic activities in the urban areas. And that, it was amazing because you did that, and then within seven months you imposed a very badly planned, stupidly designed, and horribly implemented goods and services tax. Okay, which here is an, uh, an informal sector that is just about beginning to recover, the money is still not fully available to people, and bam, you go and hit them with this, another body blow, okay? Informal economic activity has been in severe decline for the last three, four years, okay? In the beginning, that didn't show in the formal sector. If anything, organized sector benefited from that because they could enter into these activities that were earlier, you know, local biscuit makers, local small enterprises, and so on, they were wiped out. So the large enterprises could move in and capture those markets. So it looked like they were doing all right, okay? In 2017, it didn't show so much. But you cannot kill off the things that employ 85% of your workforce and get no consequences. At some point, that collapse of incomes and livelihoods in informal activity will come back in the form of lack of demand. From early 2018, we, got, we saw this happening. It began in the rural areas, but because it's rural and our media is completely urban focused, it didn't really get that much attention. But it began in the rural areas where already we saw that real wages were falling, people were not buying too many goods and services, that, you know, a whole bunch of two-wheeler sales had already started flagging and started declining from the middle of that year. All of that started happening from 2018 onwards. By late 2018, it had even started hitting the formal sector. In other words, things that had massively impacted informal activity and really created destitution across many parts of the country, that started now feeding even, even into demand for the formal sector's goods and services. So everybody jumps up and down about automobile sales. But the really big collapse has been in two-wheelers and in tractors and in the things that are used in rural areas. And of course, in the whole range of other uh, basic items of consumption. So we have had now for two years a continuous decline in consumption to the extent that now it's actually in a deep downward spiral. Because there is a thing that we economists like to talk about a lot, I'm sure those of you who've done economics kind of have it coming out of your ears, but it's called the multiplier effect, okay? Basically, you put money in the hands of somebody, they get this money, and depending on how much they tend to consume it, if you're poor, you will consume all of it, right? Because you're anyway living from day to day. The minute you get some money in your hands, you go out there, you buy food, you buy clothing for your children, you get their school books, you do whatever it is you have to do, you spend all your money. That means there's more demand in the local economy for goods and services. Shopkeepers sell you stuff, service providers sell you stuff. They then demand from someone else. So there's a multiplier, right? It's a positive process. Where there's a very high rate of consumption, you can get very high multipliers. I can tell you for the rural employment guarantee, there have been some studies 
in Gujarat, the world places, would show you a multiplier as high as four. That is, you spend 100 rupees and 400 rupees is generated in that rural economy. So there can be really positive, very strong effects when you spend. But the opposite also happens. There are negative multiplier effects, right? So the less you spend, the more someone loses a job, the more someone's real wages fall, the less they are able to spend, they cut back, the shopkeeper cannot sell, he or she then asks for less PGSA as they were, the supply chain gets affected, so you can actually destroy the economy through the negative multiplier effect. And that's really what's been happening in a large part of the country now for the last um, year, really. This is not rocket science, in fact, it's not it's very, very obvious, okay? What's going on is actually very clear and it's in your face. For some reason, the government has refused to accept it. So, I, I think it was mentioned in the last uh, session that, you know, this is a government that does not believe in science. It doesn't believe in economics either, for sure. Okay? It, but, you know, here's the thing about the economy, and in that sense, it's not exactly like natural laws, but it's, it's kind of similar. You can bully people, you can manipulate people, you can divert people, you can persuade people to go and vote for some completely opposite of their own interests. But the economy, you can't do that to. You can't browbeat an economy into submission. It's got its own laws, you know? You cut demand, it's going to affect you. It's going to have a negative multiplier effect. It's going to generate less output. Investors will be less willing to invest. It's going to keep going down. Some of them haven't got that in their head yet. They, they think that you know you can treat everything the same. You can push the economy around the same way you push people around. And that's a mistake. But it also means that really, when it comes to economic policy, and I say this with a lot of fear, they actually haven't got a, a clue. Okay? Why is this important? Because ultimately, the real losers are not them. The real losers are us. Okay? All the people who are going to be denied jobs, all the people who are not going to get living wages, all the livelihoods that are going to be lost in agriculture, all the collapse, all the, the distress that we find among farmers, all of that will continue because here is a government that's completely clueless. Okay? Why are they clueless? Well, okay. <laughs> um, no. Okay, yeah, you just put it beautifully. They are pracharaks, not vicharaks. <laughs> but because of this, because of this, a lot of what's been happening in the last year with respect to the economy can be explained. And why everything, every time they claim that they've put in all these measures, it's actually the opposite. And the impact is actually the opposite. Okay? Uh, the budget, as you said, is just the latest in all of these measures. So when the slowdown became evident, for a long time they were in denial. They kept saying, no, no, it's not a, a real slowdown. I mean, there's so many people are attending the latest premiere in Bollywood, you know, so obviously there can't be a slowdown because who would go to the movies if things are bad? Or uh, what was the other? They, they keep finding other indicators. Um, the reason, employment is not down. Nobody's counting Uber drivers, apparently. <laughs> which is simply not true, and so on and so forth. So they were in denial for a very long time. When they finally accepted that there's a slowdown, and I have just explained to you how this is really a demand side problem, right? You can see that the whole problem is a collapse in demand because of this, first, this change in income distribution for workers and farmers and all got less and less of the economic pie, and then on top of that, these attacks on livelihood and wages through demonetization and GST. So it's a demand problem. How do you address it? Supply side measures. So what will we do? We will give a tax cut to corporations. We will actually uh, you know, tell banks, please go out and lend more. We will do various things which are all addressing the supply side. No surprise, it has no effect. Because investors are not going to invest if they're already sitting on huge stocks and unable to sell them. Why should you go out there and do more? Similarly, basically the attempt of this budget is once again, I don't know how many of you survived that budget speech, but those of you who actually you know, bravely sat through it will remember that she kept talking about a 16-point agenda on agriculture, how they're going to promote volunteers to help create fisheries, how they're going to do I mean, all kinds of strange things. 
nothing to actually increase demand, nothing to increase consumption. Now, why is this weird? Because for a change, economists across the spectrum, not just crazy lefties from JNU, but across the spectrum, have been saying, for God's sake, do a fiscal stimulus to increase demand. We have the head of CII saying it. We have the IMF chief economist saying it. I mean, it's come to the, it's so bad that even the IMF is saying it. Okay? So you had all of this. And what do they do? They actually don't do any of that. Uh, the speech was bad enough, but if you look at the numbers, everything is actually cut. All the most employment intensive sectors, agriculture, employment guarantee, food, health, education, there are cuts. And this is, by the way, the good news. The good news, why? Because these numbers are all false. Okay? So, you know, we know that the GDP data can't be trusted. We know that so data are the new whatever, but basically when they are forced to bring out data, mostly they manipulate it. Now it turns out you cannot trust the budget data either, okay? Every single number in that budget, and I'm putting it down for you right now so you don't get a shock later on, is a lie, okay? I'm serious, I'm not joking. Every single item of the receipts, the revised estimates for what they're spending this year, and on, uh, on what they have received this year is a lie. Because what they're doing is they present the budget one month early. The year ends in the end of March. We have data only till the end of December. So they have to estimate what's going to happen in the last three months. That's where they lie. So they are pretending or they're claiming that they will get 66% of the expected receipts in the last three months. <laughs> And tax revenue will go up by 60% in the last three months. 60% of the tax revenue is going to happen only in the last three months. More than 66% of all the other receipts, including disinvestment, blah, 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 will come in the last three months. On that basis, they're saying we're going to do all this spending. Okay? Now, obviously, they're not going to get these receipts. And they are dumb, but they're not that dumb. They know they're not going to get these receipts. So what do they do? They say... Oh, uh, they have already sent messages to every ministry, no more spending. NREGA, which to survive at its current levels will need a thousand, a hundred thousand crore, the okay, one lakh crore it will need, is not going to get more than 65,000 crore. Okay? We already know that the FCI is not going to be paid. I mean, you can say the FCI is used to it, it never gets paid, but this is really serious. It now has a huge debt burden and it has to pay interest on the loans that it takes because the government doesn't pay it. The um, Anganwari workers are not going to be paid. Health workers are not going to be paid. And so on and so forth. State governments haven't even got their dues of the last quarter. That is to say, state governments, which were supposed to get their share of taxes last for October to December, haven't got it yet. They still haven't received it, it's February. They may or may not get it. Like they may or may not get the money for the rest of the year. This is what is going to happen. And we will not know because they will lie to parliament. Nobody will call them out for breach of privilege. Uh, you have to tell. When Supriya Sule is here, you have to tell her, please, please, breach of privilege to the finance minister for lying to parliament. Yeah? So all of this is basically means that the spending that I've told you, the reductions that I've told you, are just what they declare. The actual reductions are even lower. So what does it mean? Here's a situation where we're in an economic crisis. It's a downward spiral, last minute. Downward spiral, okay? Uh, consumers can't spend. Workers can't spend. Farmers have no money. Private investors are not willing to spend because, in fact, there's no demand. The only sector that can actually lift the economy right now is the government. That's the only agency that can somehow can go out there and spend and raise the economy out of this morass. What are they doing? They are cutting spending. They're reducing it. They're adding to the economic mess. Now, why are they doing it? This is an interesting point because if, if the basic claim is Hindu Rashtra, then shouldn't they at least want to keep Hindus happy? I don't get it. I'm not understanding. You know, what, what's, what is the thinking that is going on in this? I, I haven't understood it. But we can see the outcome. 
we can see that this is an outcome of downward spiral that has terrible implications for the economy. So just last point I want to say that, you know, uh, as I said, I'm in awe of this younger generation. I think you guys are terrific. You really, you have all the wit and knowledge and ability to articulate matters. Please do not allow anybody to tell you that economics is too complicated or technocratic or difficult to figure out. It's too important to be left in the hands of either pseudo-economists in the government or others. You have to go out there and recognize it for what it is and call it out and make a stand on this one as well. Thanks very much.